Hey cousins, I'm Shamaya. It's like papaya, except it's not. And this is Plot Twist Please, a place where I like to use pop culture in order to help make our brains a little cozier. Hit that subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this. Let's get into it. Am I going to tell you about a dream I had? Yeah, I'm going to tell you. If you don't know, which you probably don't because I have never told you, I tend to have very vivid dreams. They are very fantastical. I've had underwater dreams, you know, can't watch zombie movies because then I'll have zombie dreams. It's a whole ordeal. The images in my head are very present and palpable. Okay. So the past few weeks, I have been having a series of dreams and they have all been involving extreme situations. <laughs> so prepare yourselves. Um, let me explain the first one. And I promise I'm going to make this as painless as possible because nobody likes to hear somebody go on and on on about a dream, right? Nobody wants that. That being said, here I go. So I'm on a dock. Who am I with? Couldn't tell you. But I am with people I know and care about and am familiar with. I know that much. It's cloudy outside, not the ominous kind, but just a regular schmegular cloudy day. Below the dock, there's murky water, okay? Maybe a pond. And y'all know that I knew this was a dream because I, I as a negress, <laughs> as a negress, that's the feminine version of Negro, I don't mess with ponds like that, okay? Never have, never will. A great lake? Sure. Give me some uh, chlorine doused pools. You know, give me some clear water near the shore. But a pond? <laughs> Baby. <laughs> We're asking for trouble. <laughs> We're asking for trouble. Okay, so there's a pond below me. In the pond, a friend of mine is like wading in the water, you know, kicking in the water, doggy paddling, whatever people do in ponds. What do people do in ponds? Whatever it is, that's what they're doing. So suddenly, suddenly, I see something in that water. I see something in that water, girl. That thing in that water has a tail. A tail, do you hear me? I do not mess with ponds. I do not mess with ponds, y'all. And the tail has scales. And then I realize the tail has a body. And at this point, I have seen everything I need to see. I start screaming. Like, I've never scrumped. What came from my throat, I had never heard it before. Get out the water now. Get out right now. I start screaming. And my friend in the water says, huh? I say, get out right now, yelling at the top of my voice. And they go, what? Just so calm, so too calm. I'm over here like, you about to be lunch meat. Get out of that water. Vacant expression on their face. Almost no reaction to what I'm saying. And at this point, I'm like reaching for my friend, jumping up and down. Like, I think I'm bawling, I think. I think that's what's happening. And then I wake up. Of course, I'm disturbed. Disturbed? Disturbed? Okay? Of course, I stay awake after that and you know start scrolling youtube till it's time for my work day next dream happens a few days later all right walk with me i'm on a train the first thing i notice about this train is that it's not like a modern train this train is vintage vintage okay i mean like 1930s industrial revolution era like you as a passenger can hear the train car breathing kind of old right i noticed Second, that I am in the car where everyone's luggage is, right? For whatever reason. No other people, nor no seats, just luggage. The last important thing I notice is that these people's belongings in the car are very disheveled. Like, these people were going to be upset when they found out what happened to their luggage because stuff was thrown everywhere. Like, clothes, shoes, books, haphazardly, everywhere you look, right? In this train car. Then, out of the corner of my eye, guess what I see? I see... A tail going like this at the top from the top of the car as if there was a tiger just resting just chilling at the top of the train car that I am in I book it to the next train car and start warning people to get off you know I'm like get get off the train there's there's something in here and this thing in here this thing in here is not supposed to be in here at the same time we're in here like something's wrong um I'm like get off the train everybody get off the train and everyone just stares at me like like I'm crazy like everyone just stares at me no movement nothing almost not even registering what i'm saying i wake up so you might be thinking shamaya what is this point what is the point of sharing this about you you're in a little dream okay hold your peace i'll reveal that at the end of the episode what we're here to talk about today is cycles and just to kind of segue into this topic for today, there's a very particular cycle that was consistent with those two 
dreams, right? There was someone who was like in on something dangerous in a particular situation that can endanger other people. And that person tried to warn a bunch of people about the potential danger. Um, that's a cycle that was consistent. There's more to dig into that I'm going to wait till the end of the episode to give you because you gotta wait for your treat. You gotta wait for your dessert, all right? But today we're here to talk about pick me's and specifically the cycle of a pick me. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'm gonna be utilizing the following definition of a pick me. A woman exhibiting desperate, attention-seeking behavior, usually arising out of social insecurity in order to entice or attract a man as a romantic partner. So there are other definitions of pick me's out there, you know, for some people, someone I interpret and pick me as someone who tries to seek male invalidation by, you know, insinuating that she's, quote, not like other girls. That's not the kind of pick me I'm talking about. Um, another kind of, quote, pick me might try to, like, become the third person in a non-ethically, um, well, okay, in an ethically non-monogamous, is that how you say that? A non, an ethically, an, uneth- an unethically non-monogamous relationship what i'm talking about is is the side piece right that's what i'm talking about that's not the kind of pick me we're talking about today we're not talking about side pieces today we're talking about the general pick me who feels like they need to alter themselves in order to appeal to a man and and when i think about it too the term pick me is inherently misogynistic because it's you know categorizing women in a way that diminishes their actual fears and experiences diminishes the traumas that 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 turn someone into a pick me so in order to get inside of the mind of a pick me in order to you know get a full scope of the kind of person that a pick me would be and you know how someone becomes a pick me how someone stops being a pick me i just thought we'd look at this from all angles because i like to be thorough And also, as a neurodivergent person, I feel like a lot of the cousins out there, the neurodivergent cousins listening might relate to this specific kind of pick me I'm going to be referring to today, which is the person who feels they need to alter themselves in order to achieve romantic partnership with a man. So in case you missed that, I am a reformed pick me. Yes, I admit that. Leave a comment below in this YouTube video or in this podcast episode if you can relate because I know more of you are out there I know you're out there so how does someone become a pick me you ask let's refer to the part of the pick me cycle I like to call the hunger phase with you know a pending alternate name being the thirsty phase I think whether or not you become a pick me has a lot to do with how much confidence you have initially when you enter a romantic dynamic now contrary to public belief all right I'm gonna I'm gonna rock your world here a little bit there are two main kinds of confidence that I've seen you know as a 20 something walking the earth the kind that tells you that you're amazing and the kind that tells you that other people think that you're amazing. And I'd argue that these two kinds of confidence come from two different places. Walk with me, walk with me, all right? So the first kind of confidence is knowing how great you are outside of every cultural, societal, political kind of conditioning. It's how you feel about yourself outside of external factors. I understand that in order to do this, you've got to work really hard because the world is not kind. (laughs) And it's not easy to develop a sense of self outside of cultural conditioning, but it can be done and has been done, has been done, believe it or not. You know, there are people who society has decided are disposable, you know, not worthy of care, black people, disabled people, fat people, other kinds of disenfranchised people. You know, their confidence is always working against the current odds are they have to have a strong sense of self in spite of how others treat them women of color (laughs) women of color women of color you know that's that's one kind of confidence the second kind of confidence on the other hand is working with the current it's the kind of confidence that is completely built off of or fed into by societal conditioning so you know conventionally attractive people men who are financially well off or born into wealthy families or you know, people with a lot of privilege in society (laughs) tend to just come out of the womb with a lot more confidence, not out of the womb, but just through the way they move through the world than people who don't have those 
characteristics attached to them or who aren't perceived in that way you know it's pretty simple it's if you have been treated like the prize since you were a little baby and as if everybody wants you or rather that everyone should want you you just might start to believe it so where does the pick me fit in here well the answer is anywhere and everywhere yeah bait and switch baby i know i know you feel fooled you feel bamboozled you know someone who society elevates couldn't possibly be a pick me right wrong because the truth is even though people who society mistreats are more susceptible to lacking in confidence pick me itis doesn't care who you are and pick me itis makes you hungry it's like a parasite that must be constantly fed Editor Shamaya here clarifying something. So when I'm talking about the confidence that you don't have to be a pick me in order to have the romantic partnerships that you deserve, I'm referring to the first kind of confidence that I mentioned. The first kind of confidence is knowing you have intrinsic value without outside factors. The second kind is knowing you have intrinsic value because of outside factors. Being a pick me is something that happens when you don't know you have inherent value without those outside factors, which is the first kind of confidence. So that's what I'll be referring to when I talk about confidence going forward. Thank you. We, the collective we, assume that only unconventionally attractive people lack confidence and only conventionally attractive people are confident, but that's not necessarily true. I mean, I'm hot and I'm very insecure. <laughs> You're insecure, don't know what for. But yeah, if, if you are a black person who went to a PWI, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So now that we've learned that A, a pick me usually emerges from the soil of an untended to sense of self, i.e. someone who lacks confidence, and B, a pick me can be anyone under the right circumstances. Now let's talk about the next phase of the pick me cycle. The queasy phase. I'm sorry this is like getting a little like gross and like visceral, but I just, I needed the image. I needed, I needed the imagery so that we can be on one accord so you can understand what I'm talking about. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on this one because I think it's self-explanatory, but I digress. This is the phase where a pick me starts to feel oh, real bad. Oh, real bad. It starts to hurt. You know, they start to realize it's not all cracked up to be. You know, you're either getting taken advantage of as a pick me or you're in a relationship where the person you're with doesn't even know the real you because you've been playing a role the whole time. Or you realize you never liked the person in the first place because at the end of the day, they were just a warm body. Now, the third phase is what I like to call the purging phase. And this is the tragic, the most tragic, I think. At least it feels the most tragic when you're in the middle of it. You know, it's the most uncomfortable, um, but you know that it's necessary. This is the point of no return. You know, this is where you've, you've looked at the mess that is behind you. You look at what got you here and you have to reconcile with that. You, the things that you were feeling, the queasiness you were feeling, those instincts start to kick in and you start to realize that those instincts were there for a reason. You start to realize that those gross feelings were trying to tell you something. The discomfort, the unhappiness you felt was your body trying to warn you. You can't hold in your discomfort any longer. And, you know, sometimes that discomfort turns into disdain. We're going to get to that. I see you. I see you. Okay, we're getting to that. To the point where you need to eject yourself out of the situation. Like, you just need to eject it out of your body. Like, you need you need it and you to not be in the same zip code. Okay? This can happen by, by your own free will. This can happen if that person you're with breaks up with you. Um, and if that's the case, sorrows, prayers. I don't know what else to say. Sorrows, prayers, goodbye. But when that happens, when that tie is severed, you're bound to experience an influx of emotion and most likely, uh, most likely a lot of different emotions at once. Um, uh, to the, yeah, I, I'm talking like I know because I do know. I do know what it's like to come out of a pick me situation and to be like, oh, Oh no, we shan't ever live in this soap code again. 
We are moving out. We are taking all of our things with us. If anything smells like this house that I used to live in, burn it. This thing, this thing needs to be gone from my life forever. I never want to look at it again. I don't want to have a whiff of it around me. Anything that smells like it, sounds like it, looks like it, feels like it, I don't want anywhere near me. And that happens at the end of this phase. But what people don't like to talk about is the part where you're still reconciling with what you put yourself through. That don't feel too good. Too good. It don't feel good. That, that, that part in the middle is the part people don't like to talk about. <laughs> because it's painful. It's painful. Uh, now, as a late diagnosed autistic, uh, who is a self-proclaimed former pick me, there are a few things that I noticed popping up in my psyche during my whirlwind of a purging phase. Maybe these things might sound familiar to you. Anger, because other people being selfish at my expense makes me mad. <laughs> the second thing of sadness and grief. My heart hurts for that girl who would allow herself to be treated that way and big bad shame because that past version of myself is so unrecognizable to me that looking back makes me feel for a lack of better term ill here's how i deal with all of these feelings right i truly think that anger for autistic people is often a sign that we've experienced injustice and or something we perceive to be injustice based on our current value system. For example, I am somebody who deeply believes people should care about the well-being of other people. You know, it's just something that I can't get away from. Um, if someone does something that doesn't reflect them moving in that way, I get angry. Even though I know that person's value system has nothing to do with, well, Actually, we affect other people in the world. <laughs> we are humans who affect other humans. That We can't get away from that. That's just the fact of life. Sorry. But for some reason, I tend to take it personally. If someone's value system doesn't reflect mine, I just get really up in arms. I get really like rigid um, when it comes to that. Like when it comes to community with other people, I get really rigid in my mind about the kinds of value systems I think other people should hold or, sh or should ascribe to. You know, and I get angry particularly because I think that empathy is an important tool for the greater good. And I think that harm should ultimately result in consequences. You know, that it should come at a cost. You know, that's just me. You know, I think that it should come at a cost. And I don't tend to get along well with people who think causing other people harm is not a big deal. But what I did learn was that anger or feeling anger can be validating. And sometimes. When someone harms you and seems to get away with it, i.e. suffer zero consequences, anger can be a tool. Now, not a tool to punish yourself or to cause further harm to the person who harmed you, but to cause harm to the person who harmed you, but it can be a signifier of your boundaries, the boundaries you actually want to hold in order to build safer, healthier relationships with people in the future. You know, I don't give advice, cousins, all right? but. What I will say is that the anger that festers is not the kind that's good for you, right? It's it's the kind that's active, you know, working out, making yourself better, doing things that that pour into you and who you want to become. Because here's here's the here's another thing, right? There is a common phrase that people use who are not autistic. Um, they use the phrase, you know, um, the best revenge is being a better version of yourself. That used to tick me off, man. That used to make me so mad. But I realized that it wasn't literal, right? Surprise, surprise. What they actually meant was focus on you because the person is going to do what they're going to do. They're going to continue to harm people in this cycle, and that has nothing to do with you. But you, do you owe it to yourself to be the main character of your life. And I know it sounds cliche, whatever, but you owe it to yourself to not let what they did to you turn you ugly. You know, you... You deserve to have a better life and letting something fester, letting something literally make you sick is not going to help you do that. Second, sadness and grief. Now, someone on TikTok said this, and I'm going to have to tag them in the description of this episode, but you know that moment when you remember an event that wasn't necessarily traumatizing, but was a huge reflection of you not having valued yourself in that moment the way you should have? You know, the sadness you feel in that moment thinking back at that is necessary because it means that condi those conditions are no longer acceptable 
for you, for the person you are today. It's a sign of growth. If you were a pick me today, you wouldn't have noticed anything wrong with you behaving in a way to get chosen, quote unquote, or you allowing people to treat you a certain way, or you staying in situations that were not good for you. You wouldn't see anything wrong with that. And I know it hurts to look at that version of yourself and be like, man, she deserved better. But I think, I think it's a good sign to know that you deserved better because it means that better is coming. And lastly, big bad shame, right? It's, I, I think as much as we would hate to admit, you know, I think, I think we need to, and I'm going to touch your hand when I say this, we as a collective need to come to terms with the fact that it is embarrassing. It's embarrassing to get played, especially by a man. I'm sorry. That's, that's, that's toxic. Um, it is embarrassing to get played. It feels pitiful. It's, it's embarrassing to admit that we got tricked. And because the reality of it, if it is, we think we got tricked by a person, but we actually got tricked by a system, right? The kind of system that raises young girls to desire partnership and young boys to desire power, specifically the kind of power that comes with conquering young girls. You feel, you know, it, even though we, 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 you know, the evolved version of us might know this, that it's a system, right? That sets us up to fail. We still, we still feel like we need to blame a person. So we blame ourselves, we blame the person who harmed us. Don't get me wrong, people make decisions. People make decisions in the world. But I think people still deserve grace for those decisions including you. Maybe we want to feel like we were one of the smart ones, quote unquote, who couldn't get played. Maybe we want to feel that way, that we were above it all. But let me tell you something on this day, all right? Look at me in my eyes when I say this. Every single woman, woman has gotten played, okay? Every single one. I don't care how beautiful, privileged, charming, confident, smart, accomplished, polished, bad, feminine you are. If you've dated a man, if you date men, you've gotten played by one. And I don't think, but, but I still think that every single one of these women deserves grace. Because who are we but the sum of the things that almost destroyed us? And you know what? Maybe I want to defend the pick me's today. Maybe that's just what Shamaya is going to do today. Maybe it's defend pick me day. Okay? Maybe it's not pie day. Maybe it's defend the pick me's day. Because none of us are any better than them. You know, in the right circumstances, in the right, you know, in the middle of a drought, in an apocalypse, you hear me, I see you, COVID couples. Anyone can become a pick me. Anybody can be a pick me, right? Pick me itis could soon be knocking at your door. That being said, I want to revisit those dreams that I was talking about at the beginning of the episode, right? Because we gotta we gotta circle back. Gotta circle back. There's one through line that was present in both of those dreams that I described. There was one, an imminent threat, two, an obvious way of, of escape, and three, a decision to be made. In the first dream, the clear solution was to get out of the water, you know, because the alligator or whatever it was had a tail, was coming for you. In the second dream, there was an opportunity to get off the train. So where am I going with this? Where am I going? I promise, I promise we're heading somewhere. Uh, there's a map. There's a map, I promise. A lot of us spend time in places mentally that we have no business being in. And the solution is easy. Even though it can seem difficult, it's easy. Sometimes you have to let go because you deserve peace. And if you don't let some things go, you just might get eaten by an alligator. You deserve to be free of the things that weigh heavy on you, especially if those things should be weighing heavy on the people who harmed you. That is not your mess that's theirs. You deserve to be free of the mess that they dragged you into, that you willingly participated in, right? And you deserve to celebrate no longer being a pick-me. The last thing I want to leave you with is this. Being a former pick-me can make you feel like you need to be stronger, right? It can make you feel like you need to build this armor in order to ward off the scammers. And some of these men out here are scammers, like legitimate master plans out here. You know, the long game. But that aside, 
The mantra of, I just need to be stronger and then no one can trick me, isn't necessarily foolproof. For some of us, being, quote, stronger means being softer. Softer with ourselves, gentler with each and every version of ourselves, even the versions of ourselves that we became when we were starving. That's all I have for you today. Um, I had to re-record some of this because my I ran out of storage. I almost hope it doesn't happen again. Eee. <laughs> Content, let's see. Um, like, share, and subscribe. Leave a review um, so that people can see what we're talking about on here and get, you know, get the vibes on what this podcast is about. Be blessed and stay weird. Don't make me come out of the screen. You better stay weird here. All right.